Please welcome the first commander of the 1st Squadron, 89th Cavalry Regiment, Colonel Retired, Mark Stewart. I'd first like to recognize some special guests. I know there's a lot of them, so I, I, if I missed a few, it's uh, my fault. Uh, first, Miss Diana Cleveland. With the Gold Star Mother, we're lifted and honored by your presence here today. Thank you. Also, uh, I know there's a lot of 189 alumni out there, uh, but two in particular, you heard speak earlier, Mark and Fred, the squadron's first command team, thanks for making the trip. It's clear your presence here makes the squadron lineage real and tangible. I mean, you can feel it, you can feel it in your words, and I appreciate that. As many folks here know, this is the game's fourth of five uh, battalion level ceremonies in the last three days. When I sat down last night thinking of what to say, quite frankly, I, I realized that one, I probably should have started sooner, and two, this one's going to be the most difficult to write. It's the most difficult because uh, not only is it is it the inactivation piece of it, but there's something special about this cavalry squadron. And it's hard to, to really narrow down the numerous thoughts, the numerous stories to convey my, my feeling for the group of people standing in front of me. I know that a lot of people are going to come to history and some of the more tangible accomplishments, but I chose to focus on uh, Mike Anderson and Sergeant Major Bill Lopez's leadership and what I personally am taking away from that. You probably learned something from it. Although only two people, this command team may greatly shape the culture and the identity of the squadron. And for the sake of brevity, I'm just going to narrow it down to three things tonight. But before I do begin, I do want to address an accusation that you made against the last week by just a few days ago. This was public, people heard it. Mike accurately pointed out that not only do I drive a Prius, but he asserted that uh, unlike the cavalry, I'm not one for a player. Uh, although this is mostly accurate, I will, uh, you know, for the first time probably in my mediocre infantry career, publicly admit that either A, I'm extremely jealous of your big passenger savers, or I'm just really nervous when I'm surrounded by people that have more weapons than I do. One of the two. <laughs> but I'll let you decide, but get back to your attributes, Mike. Without question, the number one is trustworthy. Mike is clearly the leader that I most trust because he's a squadron, he and the squadron, you guys are there. Oftentimes, with real no guidance from higher, me, uh, the squadron would make, make a lot of great things happen without a lot of panther. And here's just a few examples of so many. The game thing. Just before we deployed, I didn't know what it was. Quite frankly, I showed up down to your headquarters and was blown away how professionally we ran that and, and won it, quite frankly. Uh, I think we won the first time level. The second one is uh, there's a company out there, a troop that just moved, uh, but the Michael. Most brigades have the Michael in their BP. And early on, we decided to move it over. And quite frankly, when we decided to move it over, like many things in a big organization, it gets stuck in staff help. And there's a lot of talk about it and all kinds of reasons not to do it, slow it down. And Mike Anderson got with his fellow commanders, and I uh, think that week, not only did you move them over, Mike, you took complete ownership of them, you gave them that flair in the first week, changed their colors, put them hats on, stenciled their vehicles. Uh, but more importantly, uh, you made them part of the team, and uh, you made them good, right? I mean, it's clear that all the deployment, their skills made the BCT better. Not only did they help eliminate some ISIS, uh, but they saved our soldiers well. And I gave you very little guidance to do that, and I appreciate it. Probably the big one, the most obvious ones, is SAR struck in the deactivation. Not just this uh, ceremony, which is top notch. But uh, you know, the Army puts out a big blanket order. They didn't really account for our deployment and our timeline and the things that went to us. And not surprisingly, it's incredibly complex. At 5.30 yesterday morning, I had to meet with Mike and all the troop commanders uh, to go over a, a few things. And when lots of stuff discussed, but the big thing that I left with Mike, it was clear that you had a solid plan that not only kind of put flex to the property, but more importantly, the personnel. And when I sit back, when I talked about it the actual right where we left, it was clear that every single troop commander, down to the, the detail that I haven't seen in a while, really knew their people. And having been around a day or two, Mike, that, that doesn't happen without your focus, your questions, and your leadership over time. It was tangible, and, and it's not common. And probably the biggest one, you've heard people talk about it, about the nine-month nine one. So 
So minus uh, the micro and beach group, uh, which has uh, some other tests, they spent the majority of their time in Elsnop Terrace, and also known as ATG. For those not familiar, ATG, according to Star Major Donaldson, is the most difficult base to get to in Peter. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to describe. It's in Syria, but it's along the Jordanian border, and quite frankly, it's rough living. Probably for the last few millennia, it's been rough living out there. And that being said, it's, it's also our America's most strategic base. It's, that's due to the geopolitical issues associated with locations, but it's also one that our senior leaders struggle with finding a feasible political solution. On the operational level, uh, Mike, the squadron head of the brigade sole partner force, which, uh, which, as you know, you were with them, which is stuck at ATG and surrounded by the Syrian uh, rough military. With the partner force, you had to manage, lead, train, counsel, control, mentor, and probably any other verb you can come up with, that partner force. And everyone in this PCT and our higher headquarters, everyone, will bow to me on this when I say, uh, at every single level, tactical, operational, strategic, no unit has ever done that better. Mike Anderson's leadership, without question, adjusted the entire United States government's options in the area. He essentially rewrote the strategy and playbook out there, all on your own, quite frankly. In addition, the squadron had to protect themselves against dozens of drone strikes, which you heard about. But for these, I just want to say, in warfare, sometimes you get lucky. But however, I know that hard work on the right priorities increases your love. And without question, this squadron's diligence, their vision, their innovation, and their teamwork, and their prioritization is why we were able to bring in the and that's just a few examples of why I trust this command team to leave soldiers in the most difficult circumstances. And that's mainly because everything you touch, you make better. Mike, your second attribute that you became is that you have high standards for yourself and for everybody else. Quite frankly, I'm not sure I'd make it and just for that. You're that good. Standards are non negotiable, Mike. And although many people talk about these in the Army, it's different and it's real in this squadron. Through your leadership, the squadron has built a culture of conviction as opposed to a culture of emotion. You can see that when we visit, but it's clear when, when you visit any time that even when people don't want to do things, they still do it. They are part of an organization that places more importance on the team than the individual. And you hold each other accountable and you thrive. But by holding these standards for everyone all the time, you built a real team, not just one that we mentioned in command philosophy. And I'll give you a few examples of that. It's like, hey, when you build a real team, people don't want to leave it. I can think of several examples, but one of the ones that sticks out most in my mind is when I visited APG, you took me to speak to some of vendor folks uh, that weren't even from Fort Drum. They're attached to you out there. They were completing their nine-month uh, deployment in, once again, some very rough conditions. And quite frankly, they asked if they could stay. That doesn't happen. Right? These are air defenders, quite frankly, and they want to stay and be a part of the squadron well past uh, and sacrificed away from the family. Secondly, as the, defendant, uh, as the squadron defended ATG, Mike's the only one in the history of my career that I have seen rehearse a black and gold plan pull up. For those that are, are unfamiliar, this is like a contingency plan that involves the entire unit essentially keeping their base and actually spreading out. And I've never seen it, like, especially a full dress rehearsal. It's a more painful thing that I could possibly describe, that's why nobody does it, because it involves moving hundreds of vehicles, it involves uh, ensuring you have all the right stuff and all, every contingency you can think of, and, and so people shy away from it. But you did two of them, if I remember correctly, and you did them before we even got shot at. That's impressive. And one more, probably my favorite story, near the end. General Curley came to visit Mike, and I was out there near the end. And uh, if you've never met General Curley, he's a CENTCOM commander, extremely intelligent and effective leader, but he's also a uh, larger than life. Uh, and he can't be intimidating for a lot of people. But we took uh, his group up on a, uh, on a rooftop and we were showing him the base and the huge group narrowed down, just a few of us up there. And he, Mike was explaining the defenses and what he'd done. And uh, he didn't question me, but he put me to the test and he asked, uh, how long would it take this to happen? 
Am I without skipping a beat this three minutes? Now, anybody who's been in the army today, like, you're a little worse. I absolutely had zero doubt that Mike and his squadron had rehearsed this and he knew exactly how long it would take. And you hear the call on the radio, you hear a big speaker go, you see people moving. The four-star general had a watch going. And at three minutes exactly, they pulled right at that uh, third fighting position. I was like, don't doubt my guy who came to this point. <laughs> it, it was probably my favorite. Uh, and the last one, Mike, your third attributed judgment. When people think of the, off, or the army, we often associate it with rules and orders, which I'm not say, saying is completely wrong. However, the longer I'm in, the more I understand that what we're looking for is someone who knows when to break the rule. Life typically involves several values or rules colliding with each other, and in the army, it's often the leader's job to decide between them based on the principles and the context they're in. So without question, Mike, you excel in both fearless in combat, and you earn my trust through your judgment. To start wrapping it up, I'm completely impressed by Mike and the squadron. The squadron has no bigger fan, and just don't tell my infantry friends I said that, <laughs> please. Uh, and although I mentioned it before, I will always believe that when you have great people who have a purpose and are given the freedom to work towards that purpose, great things are going to happen. It's clear that the squadron under Mike and Sergeant Major Phil Olobos, you proved this accurate. So thank you. To Karen, I also want to thank you for being Mike's better half. Clearly, he wouldn't be who he is today without you. And just as important, thank you for being a leader, the Wolverine spouses and families. Right now, right now. Right now. I forgot. It's Wolverine. Right now. I forgot you guys do that, my fault. <laughs> I, I was supposed to call up there. So just, uh, he told me that in fairness like two minutes ago. Uh, but hey, during the deployment, that's hard time. And your leadership, Karen, an example is what we need. I can't thank you enough for helping Mike sh shoulder the burden of command. To both you and Mike, I wish you the best when Mike uh, moves on to, to the PhD. Thank you. And I hope you get some downtime in your next job. Wolverine. Right now! Virgin Honor. Time to go. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming down, especially our 189 veterans uh, for making the trip out here. Appreciate that. Uh, and the whole squadron does also. Uh, to Mrs. Cleveland, just because the squadron is inactivating uh, doesn't mean the memory of your son and all our fallen Wolverines will be forgotten. Uh, we have 500 new or 500 Wolverines right now that are going to carry their memories to different installations and across our nation, so they'll never be forgotten. Uh, as an infantryman, about eight, seven months ago, I arrived with the squadron, and as my fellow infantry sergeant majors like to tell me, uh, we wear funny hats and some weird things on our boots. I, as an infantryman, again, I, I have embraced our culture and tradition as I wear a Stetson and spurs in my boots, so I think I've adopted uh, the cavalry way of life. Uh, again, I arrived in the squadron while I deployed, and I quickly saw how well trained they were. Uh, in October, you can say the enemy gave us a good punch to the face, and because of our training, uh, we regained our composure and got back into a fight. And uh, it was a defensive fight, but I feel that we won and we brought everybody home. And that's just because of the training that and preparedness the squadron had. Uh, to Colonel Anderson, I couldn't have picked a, I couldn't have been worked with a better ranger buddy. Uh, I appreciate everything you've done for me and it allowed me to to be the way I am with some of my humor, even though some people don't think it's funny. I do. My wife does. Uh, and very short. That's it. I appreciate everybody. Uh, Cloud Glory, we're in our right now. Today is a solemn but proud day as we honor the history of the Wolverines and ceremonially inactivate 1st Squadron A9 Cavalry Regiment, transforming it into the 189 Cav Squadron Detachment. And the back of you, sir, let me lead the charge in the battle line, good John. And let me at least see the bill of books be never remembered loud and long. Represented from left to right, the true star, Charlie Troop, Crazy Horse, led by Captain Henri Noel and First Sergeant Joshua Van Dyke. Did a bouquet of flowers, thanking them for all their support and devotion and many contributions during their tenure at the First Squadron A9 Calvary Regiment. We need to shape and bring about your ultimate purposes. And so, Father, I thank you for the people, the fellowship.
guys remember this? Remember that? All right, so this flew over the headquarters for 15 months. Uh, when, we, when we broke camp, I took it down, I put it away, I've been holding on to it for a special occasion. Uh, Colonel Anderson is not going to give you the colors. <laughs> we are going to give you the flag. The excellence of the gazing ceremony is an event part of tradition, honor, respect, and sacrifice. The ceremony begins as commander and first arm gazes the gap. Post the guy on at the base of the monument, signifying the truth, return to history. 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 Signifying the truth, Thank you. 